Hi, everybody. So nice to see you here. Thank you for welcoming me. I know you're all pretty tired after the end of this uh, really extraordinary conference. Um, I also just want to say how excited I am to be here at the Big Ideas Fest. I didn't know exactly what to expect, and it is extraordinary, and it's been uh, really inspirational to watch you all uh, design and interact with each other and collaborate and really um, come up with these innovative ideas. So um, thank you. Thank you to ISKME and, and uh, Big Ideas Fest for, for having me here. Uh, so I uh, am the prize manager of the Global Learning X Prize. Um, the X Prize Foundation is a nonprofit organization. We are based in Los Angeles, California, down the road ish. Um, and the Global Learning X Prize is a competition to create uh, software, literacy software, to teach children who have little to no access to schooling how to read, write, and do math in 18 months. So to get started, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about XPRIZE as an organization, explain who we are and what we do. Um, a lot of it will sound very familiar to you, given what you do here. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I came to start working at XPRIZE, um, and then get into the details of our competition. And I'd like to leave a lot of room for Q&A at the end. Uh, so please, I welcome any sort of feedback or questions, and uh, would love to have a conversation with you at the end of the presentation. Okay, so first of all, XPRIZE, as I mentioned, we're a nonprofit organization. And what we do is create, design, and manage incentivized prize competitions for the benefit of humanity. Our tagline is making the impossible possible. The slides that you'll see up here on the screen, this is from um, our big event called Visioneering that we hold at least once a year. Uh, and right now, actually, a number of people from our office are in India with their India Visioneering. Um, and what we do at these is come up with, we basically uh, come up with the opportunity and the challenges. What do we need to create a prize around that is a solvable piece of a major problem? So we bring all sorts of people to visioneerings. So we have politicians and educators and uh, entertainers, all types of people to come up with these ideas. And they go through a whole um, design process there. And they even compete at visioneering to come up with what are these major challenges that we're, we're working for towards. What if we could solve all the world's grand challenges? Like developing clean alternative energy, enough to light an entire city. And all our dreams. Or finding a way to clean up our oceans. What if plastic could just get rid of itself? What if XPRIZE could change everything? I prized the day I woke with bionic legs instead of wheels. Or make your doctor as close as your cell phone. What if the doctor was your cell phone? What if we could make the impossible possible? We can by unleashing the human spirit, by setting a target and incentivizing competition. Somewhere in the world, someone will have the solution. When you're looking for that needle in a haystack, the key is to inspire that needle to look for you. By creating and managing large-scale competitions to benefit humanity, the XPRIZE Foundation has become the recognized leader in crowdsourcing innovation to solve the world's grand challenges. XPRIZES operate at the intersection of audacity and achievability. They are competitions with clear, measurable objectives that focus the world's innovators and entrepreneurs on achieving those goals. The XPRIZE Foundation sparks innovation and inspires the belief that we can create a better future. XPRIZE's target market failure and define the challenges, not how to solve them. The XPRIZE Foundation, making the impossible possible, one prize at a time. So, <laughs> I did not make that video. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that just gives you a glimpse into the type of work that we do at XPRIZE. Um, as you saw in the video, we have um, certain major categories and areas that we look for innovation in. And that's global development, energy and the environment, life sciences, exploration, 
and education. Uh, so the Global Learning X Prize is our first education-based uh, prize that we are doing. Uh, and we have others that are in development, but we uh, launched in September, so we're really excited to add education uh, to the work that we're doing at X Prize. So what makes a good incentive prize? A lot of this you will already know from the work you did in your Action Pro Labs. Um, first of all, thinking about figuring out what the problem is rather than the solution. A lot of times people want to first say, how are we going to solve something, rather than defining what is the piece of the major challenge that we really want to address. What is the opportunity there to get innovators to be able to solve? Um, as one of the facilitators said in uh, Action Collab that I sat in on, we're not trying to boil the ocean. You know, you want to get one piece of something that you, that's actually solvable. We also believe that innovation can come from anywhere. A lot of times people look to who is considered an expert in the field for the answer. And we believe at XPRIZE that anyone might have the answer that could solve these challenges that we're looking to solve. Another exciting piece here is that we crowdsource innovation. So when we have many teams who are all working towards finding the same sort of solution, we're learning from all the things that the different teams and innovators are doing. So we get to really figure out um, from lots of different perspectives uh, what, how you best innovate. And as I said in the clip that you saw, we try to be audacious but also achievable. This is something I know you, all, you are all working with as well. So how can we create something that is beyond the horizon that we can see right now of what is before us, but that is also something that we can do and that we must solve? So in my previous life, I, was, I taught history. So you'll excuse me having a couple historical slides in here. Um, incentivized prizes are not a new thing. Uh, you'll see here on this slide uh, Napoleon. And when he was marching across Europe, shockingly, he found that people don't always want to give food to invading armies. Um, so he launched in 1795 the Food Preservation Prize. And this was won by an unlikely uh, person who was a candy maker. And this candy maker developed the technology which boils the food and puts it in airtight containers, uh, which is still the basis of the technology that we use today in modern canning. Uh, I had to. Uh, another one that you may be familiar with this image of Charles Lindbergh, uh, who famously did the first flight across the Atlantic in the spirit of St. Louis. What you may not know is that he did this famous voyage in a, as part of a prize competition for a $25,000 prize purse. So this prize was first announced at the end of World War I. People assumed that this feat would be achieved by a World War I pilot or something, and Charles Lindbergh was a U.S. Postal Service flyer. People called him the Flying Fool. Um, but lo and behold, he's the one who went, to, went on to actually cross the Atlantic successfully, and transform the idea of what we believed was possible. Soon thereafter, uh, there was the commercial airline industry, which I'm sure all of you have, have taken part of. Um, and so it was just changing the idea of travel and space and what we could do. And again, we don't use the same types of plane that Charles Lindbergh first had this innovation with. I mean, he was cutting the corners of his maps off to cut weight on his plane. Um, but it is the idea of expanding beyond our horizons of what is possible. Also, in this prize, as I mentioned, it was a $25,000 prize purse, but because of all the, pro the teams that were competing, there was over $400,000 worth of research going into that, so you end up actually putting more research and getting more out of this than the prize purse was actually worth. So this model is what inspired our CEO and founder, Peter Diamandes, who his first love is space. Um, and we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary of awarding our first prize, the Ansari X Prize, um, which launched the commercial space industry. So it was based on this uh, model that Charles Lindbergh uh, had, had first done. So since that time, 10 years ago, we have really expanded beyond uh, those types of, of, of just space travel. Um, but just to bring this story full circle, I do want to say that if you go to Washington, D.C. right now, um, our winning prize design from this Spaceship One is hanging next to the spirit of St. Louis um, in the Air and Space Museum. So fun fact. Um, <laughs> so... Since that time, here are just a sample of our prizes. Actually, this is a list of all of our prizes. We have awarded five prizes, and we currently have four that are active, the Global Learning X Prize being the most recently launched one. 
And you can see that there are a series of other types of prizes and challenges that we have set forth. So you can see, for example, a progressive automotive uh, competition that was about fuel-efficient vehicles, or the Wendy Schmidt oil cleanup that was based after there was that oil spill. I'm sure many of you watched on TV the oil just gushing up, and Wendy Schmidt said there must be better technology to clean up our oceans, um, and so we launched a prize that then um, ultimately bettered that technology four times um, since uh, that competition was, la- was launched. So... Um, Within all of these various prizes, I want to again reiterate that we believe that uh, innovation can come from anywhere. So just to show you a few of the competitors who have um, competed and done quite well in X prizes, one of our favorite stories um, is from the Wendy Schmidt oil cleanup that I just mentioned. So uh, the gentleman you can see on your right was a tattoo artist from Las Vegas. Um, not usually the first person you might go to uh, looking for an oil spill cleanup technology. But he was inspired by the prize. He sketched something on the back of a napkin, started testing it in bathtubs and people's pools, um, ended up teaming up with engineers, um, and did really well in our, in our competition. Uh, similarly, for the progressive automotive challenge that I mentioned before, this is a team of high school students from uh, West Philadelphia High uh, who went toe-to-toe and outperformed a number of people from leading research universities, people who outspent them um, from big companies. And so you had children, you know, high school students, who had these amazing innovation. Uh, if you have a chance to look up their story, it's actually really inspirational. They got to go to the White House. They got all sorts of national attention. Uh, but again, just to show that you can get innovation um, from anywhere. Uh, and finally, just another example, Dr. Anita Gohl, who is an academic, um, and she was the team leader uh, for the Nokia Sensing Challenge um, that her, her group won the grand prize. And she said that as an academic, she had felt like she was um, in stealth mode in her lab, wondering if her research would ever be relevant to the world outside, and would she ever really be able to um, use what she learned. And so she had the opportunity to do that here with that prize. So now I want to talk a little bit about how I got involved in XPRIZE. And uh, again, remember, I used to teach history, so we're going to go back. (laughs) Hope you have some time. Yes, that far back. Um, So this is one of my favorite family photos. Um, That's me in the stroller right there with the awesome red tights. Um, And I don't know if you can read the sign up there, but uh, my sister and I are on our way to a political rally, and that's his President Carter up there. So I'm going to date myself a little bit here. Um, so from the earliest time, my, my family, my parents in particular, really inspired in us how important it was to engage with the world around us and to at least try to do something. Um, so, uh, you know, it, you will fail at times, but to at least be engaged in what's going on. Um, so before I could walk or talk, that was uh, instilled in me. Um, if you had met me a few years later in elementary school and asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up, I would have told you an inventor. I really wanted to be an inventor, and I would sketch little designs. I'm a terrible artist, but I would still sketch these designs of, of things that I wanted to do. Um, if you fast forward a few more years, uh, you know, in high school, I was actually not a very good student, and I just want to reiterate to people this idea that um, you really you can have failure and then come back and have success, and I hope for young people out there that they... They sometimes look at adults and they think that you have it all together and that you've always been successful, but to know that most of us, everybody has struggles at various points. Um, My grades were so bad in high school, I was ineligible for extracurricular activities in ninth grade. I got rejected from a lot of 11 colleges, got into one. Um, But then I went on to become a Fulbright Scholar and get my PhD, and um, a lot of that had to do with engaging what I had done in activist work with academic work and really being able to build those connections and having a lot of educators out there who figured out how to build those those connections. So as I mentioned, I ended up uh, becoming an academic. This is my daughter and I um, at the inauguration of uh, our first female president at Lafayette College, Allison Byerly. Um, But... Don't worry, we still go to political rallies. I don't know if you can see on the left side, uh, my daughter has a newborn in in my arms at uh, the Equality Day rally. So mom and dad, the tradition lives on. (laughs) Don't worry. Um, so all of this to say, just become, before going to X Prize, um, I, I had this sort of background in trying to engage with the world. I should also mention what I did as a professor. My focus was on Africa and human rights. Um, that was my scholarship and uh, research and teaching. 
And so this was something really trying to get students to look at the world around them, again, figure out the sort of systems that lead up to how uh, when there is global inequality, and again, to just try to actively engage. So I was so excited when this opportunity came up to manage the Global Learning X Prize. It really wed all of these passions of mine, um, as well as allowed me to reconnect with my childhood self. I always wanted to be an inventor, so now I'm around inventors and innovators all the time. Um, and be in an office that has robots, it's really cool. If you guys ever have a chance to come down to LA, check out the X Prize offices. Um, and, uh, and, and really connect with, with science and technology. Um, so it was really exciting to be a part of this. So I want to give you an overview now of, of what the Global Learning X Prize is. I told you a little bit about it in the beginning. Um, so it's a $15 million competition to develop open source learning software to teach children who have little to no access to quality education, basic reading, writing, and arithmetic skills. And that is within 18 months. So we um, are putting out this challenge to the world, um, and we are asking people to start developing solutions, and the five finalists will each receive $1 million, and those are the five that will be open sourced so that they will be free and open for anybody in the world to iterate upon, to localize um, to their various communities, languages around the world. Um, and we will go to our host country, and um, these five finalist solutions are going to be deployed to uh, various villages, communities who have little access to schools and educations. And I can get into that process a little bit more if you're interested in how we, how we select that. We're going to test the kids in the beginning. Um, we will provide them with the hardware, so that's tablets and solar charging stations, um, and then the software that our teams have created. And the kids get to do whatever they want. Uh, you know, they can decide to use it individually, in groups. If they do have access to a classroom, they can bring it. We're not really saying how they, uh, how they have to use it. And at the end of 18 months, we test the kids again. And the ones that have the highest aggregate learning scores, um, that software will be the grand prize winner, and they will win an additional $10 million uh, for that winning software. So why are we doing this prize, and why are we doing this prize right now? So this is a question about basic human rights, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we still have 57 million children who have no access to primary education. Even though it is part of our universal declaration of human rights that children have the right to an education, we are failing millions of children in that regard. Even more than those 57 million who have no access to school, there are an estimated 250 million children around the world who still might go to school but are illiterate, that they can spend years in school and not actually learn how to read or write, which is quite shocking. Uh, but often this has to do with the question of scaling. So maybe there'll be one school in the area, but you'll have you know, 100 kids there of all different ages. The teacher lacks a lot of training and resources. Um, so we have made progress in terms of getting many kids to school, particularly um, in, in this century, in the 21st century. But 250 million children who remain illiterate and I don't have to tell anyone in this crowd how important education is for a child's success, overall success in life. Um, so uh, many of you probably know about the UN Millennium Development Goals that were launched at the turn of the 21st century and are now scheduled to end in 2015. So people, the international community is, is looking to say, how much progress have we made in terms of eradicating poverty and, and uh and what needs to be done. Because clearly, a lot of those goals that were set out in 2000, there are still many needs that need to be met. Although, again, there has been progress. I do want to reiterate so people, you know, there's a lot to celebrate um, that's been happening in the 21st century. Um, so here is a map. This is from the, uh, the latest data pooled about how, what sort of progress we're making. And you can see red over here is where there is the least progress, and green being the most progress. And um, Sub-Saharan Africa remains a place where there are many challenges and where a lot of times needs are not being met. So this is why we decided to operate our Global Learning X Prize in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this is going to be our first prize that is actually operated outside of the United States. We have, for every competition, we've had competitors who are from around the world, but this is the first time we're actually doing our operations overseas. We thought that was really important to go first to the place that had the most need. 
Um, and we are in the process. We've narrowed down to three host countries. We're working closely with their ministries of education, um, with civil society leaders, um, really working and talking to them about what would be helpful, making sure that our host country it wants us to be there, um, and, and really working with them to say how we're going to operate this. So stay tuned, because we will be able to announce what that one is um, early in 2015, so we will let you know. We're close to that. Um, and just so you know, also in terms of village selection and what we're looking for, um, we want to make sure, first of all, of course, um, safety for the children, as much as we can um, guarantee safety, um, equal access to both technology and education for both girls and boys, um, and that the kids have a basic nutrition level uh, so that they are able to learn, because that's a whole other uh, major challenge that we'll need to address in terms of kids being able to have the nutrition so they can learn. Um, so that is how we went about our, our uh, village selection. Now for a timeline so you can see the life of the prize. Of course, this is a many-year uh, process, as you can see by the timeline. Uh, we are in the midst of our recruitment and registration phase right now, so that means if you want to join a team, we're open. Come on, join us. Uh, we currently, we launched on September 22nd at the Social Goods Summit. Um, we were announced by uh, Gordon Brown at a breakout session of the UN General Assembly. And our CEO, Peter Diamandis, had the opportunity to be interviewed about the Global Learning X Prize by uh, former President Bill Clinton at the Clinton Global Initiative. So it was really exciting to get that sort of word out in September. Uh, we have uh, over 250 people who have filled out the first form saying that they intend to be teams. Uh, they are from over 50 countries around the world. We have um, people who are from every continent, except, except Antarctica. So if you know anybody in Antarctica, you can give them my number. Um, and, uh, but we, are, we have open registration through March 31st. So if you know people, please let them know about that. Um, after March 31st, uh, teams will have 18 months to develop their software. Um, and again, they can do this. We really try to make something that we don't want to define what the solution is. Um, we are putting up our revised guidelines up on our website, learning.xprize.org. Those should go up uh, tomorrow, probably, as soon as I get back to the office. Um, so we will have our um, updated guidelines about what this competition is. Um, one of the major changes, I will give you a... a, a, a sneak preview in something that uh, we are asking people to develop in both the mother tongue of our host country as well as in English um, so that the children, uh, you know, they learn best in their native language first before learning a secondary language. So the children will be tested um, in their mother tongue uh, and then, but we want competitors to also put their software in English and part of that is because we want this to be able to scale at the end of the competition. So the idea, the big mission is that this should be something that can be on all sorts of smart devices all over the world in any language um, and, and that can be really localized to fit that particular culture so you're not putting culturally inappropriate images or, or anything like that um, in various parts of the world. Um, then uh, you'll see at the end of 2016 there'll be the judging process. That's where we'll determine the five finalists that I mentioned before. Um, those will be the ones who will be required to open source their solutions. They'll win a million dollars each. Um, and at that point, that's when we will go into our host country, test the children using early grade reading assessment and early grade math assessment, um, and give the children uh, and, the, and the communities the software and the hardware. And at the end of 18 months, we come back, and that's when we determine which is the most um, effective software for, for the children. Our grand prize winner is projected to be announced in February of 2019. But I do want to point out that the end of the competition is really the beginning of the mission of what we want to do. Um, so it's very easy to get caught up and like, okay, who's going to win millions of dollars, and it's exciting, and it's a way you in incentivize behavior. But to not lose sight of what the major mission is here, which is to address the problem of global illiteracy. And how are we going to take the solution and find something that can then be scaled and, and work for people all over the world? So we really put attention to the post-prize industry and figure out how we're going to be able to scale those things. So we do believe here at XPRIZE that education is going to be able to transform the world of these children. We believe in harnessing uh, the natural curiosity of children. Those of you who are 
parents or aunts or uncles, grandparents, teachers, if you've seen kids with tablets, um, I mean, they usually figure them out better than we do. Uh, and uh, so already there have been early tests. Um, people on our team have done this image is, is from Ethiopia. Um, we have also uh, another nonprofit we recently spoke to was talking about their software that they had in Malawi. Um, it was math. It was a math application. And uh, somebody said, well, this worked so great in Malawi. Can it also work in the UK? So they compared the uh, scores of children who had a lot of resources, a lot more resources in the UK um, with these children in Malawi. And in both instances, the children just had amazing growth. So one teacher said that in one week of looking at software for half an hour, they would rotate the kids to have a half hour session every day for a week, that they learned three months of math curriculum in that week. I mean, it's just the types of things that people are saying you can do with education software. You know, we want to be able to bring that, harness all those ideas, um, and, and see how that might work for children who don't have access to schools. I also just want to point out there's lots of reasons why kids may not have access to school and um, that technology might be able to solve some of those things. So, for example, uh, with the Ebola outbreak, there have been all sorts of uh, interrupted education for children in those areas. Often the schools are being used for um, hospitals or you know, places where people who are affected when quarantine. And so children have no way of, of learning there. Um, there's also a lot of places where it's unsafe for girls to walk to school or there's a place that has conflict. Um, so that if children can have access to um, this sort of software, that it would mean that they could continue their educations despite what sort of circumstances they have. Um, we're also assuming all the projections by the end of this prize is that the cost of these sort of the hardware for people is just plummeting. So any of you who've been to Sub-Saharan Africa have probably seen the amount of cell phones that are there. Um, so really, that you know, people will be able to have the hardware, so we wanted to focus on software for this particular competition. So as I mentioned, we are still in registration period. Um, we would love you to get involved. Tell people you know if you think they might be interested. Um, you could join a team yourself, um, and you don't have to have the whole solution. We already um, have... Oh, yeah, high schoolers back, yes. Um, we already have a... Um, a, a site called forum.xprize.org where people are joining teams and they're saying, you know, I'm a gamer. I would like to be connected with, um, with a teacher, with a curriculum developer, um, with a neuroscientist. So really we want people from all sorts of work, walks of life um, who can join teams that are often, you know, across from different countries, um, different disciplines. Again, we can't say what the ultimate solution is. Maybe one person in their basement can do it all. Um, but we want to at least provide the opportunity for people to connect and we we believe having these sort of um, interdisciplinary uh, teams and diverse in every, every sense of the word uh, will be really helpful. Even if you don't want to join a team, you can support teams in all sorts of ways. Um, as they are forming more, as I mentioned, through March, um, they'll be looking for content. Um, because this is going for children and it's uh, about education, we want to have teachers involved, um, teachers who will also be on our judging panels for the software. Uh, so there's really lots of ways uh, to get involved here. So again, our, we are at learning.xprize.org. Um, and... That's our competition. So I would love to hear questions from you all, um, any sort of comments you have uh, about XPRIZE in general or the Global Learning XPRIZE in particular. Thank you. What is the native language of the children? Um, when we announce the host country, that is when we will announce the language. But I can say that it is a widely spoken uh, African language that has a lot of content um, with it. So we will make sure that our teams, even if they do not speak that language, that there's a lot of um, people who do speak it that they can connect to and content available and already some applications and things in that. So that was one of the things as we were looking for the various countries to make sure um, that it was a language that was spoken by millions of, of people in the region. But so that should be early 2015. We will announce both um, the country and the language. Thank you. That, that might answer some of my questions. Mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I'm wondering why you decided to sort of go very country-specific as opposed to a region-specific or even just having it open-ended, that it could be in any country with these particular criteria. Money. That's the short answer. It's very expensive to operate, so um, we... Uh, we did a crowdfunding campaign, and we um, one of the things we considered was saying if we raised enough money to operate, that we would operate in one or more countries. Um, but for each country, we are hiring local um, 
talent, um, where there's going to be in-country managers, um, there's all sorts of infrastructure, and because we are providing so much of, um, of, of the hardware and, and infrastructure there, um, it's just extremely uh, expensive to operate, and we are, despite our big prize purses, so sometimes people forget we are a nonprofit organization. That's somebody else who's given us the millions. <laughs> so um, we would love to see it in lots of different countries um, around the world, but right now it is just going to be in one specific country, but again, that's why we wanted to have the two-language solution, um, and, and we're looking to have, um, one of the judging criteria is going to be that the application would be easily localizable to other languages and cultures, because we certainly don't want it to just be for one specific country. I, I know that an, a number of large corporations, including a number here in Silicon Valley, uh, Google, for instance, mm-hmm. um, is taking a growing interest in what is happening in, in education, and Google is particularly focused on accessibility and uh, uh, using the internet and so on, doing a lot in Africa. So um, my question is, what is the role of large corporations in the X Prize? Um, are they just providing money, or uh, what are they? Uh, what is their participation uh, right now? Um, for for this particular prize, we don't have any corporate uh, sponsors. We have it's all been uh, philanthropists or generous donors who have given the money to support it. Um, what can happen is when once teams form, often they will get a corporate sponsor. We, because for fairness, we don't actually connect corporations with any particular team. But for corporations or people who are putting up the money in the in the front end, for them the advantage is they get to see this technology and get you know there's not an official first right of refusal, but they are there and watching the technology being developed and having that sort of relationship um, with the teams as they're developing it. Um, but right now, yeah, it's a you know we're an independent uh, nonprofit. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm curious just to know about uh, how targeted you've mentioned uh, literacy uh, and and numeracy with children. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are adults that also face these challenges. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense of this really needs to be targeted at young learners, broader, scalable by age in addition to geography? Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, great question. Um, Well, first of all, we do have in development um, an adult literacy competition that I um, actually believe would be U.S.-based, but it's not, you know, they're not official competitions until they are launched. Um, But one of the things, one of the potential teams that I spoke with at a conference was saying that they did something, um, they did some work in Mexico, and what they found was trying to make sure that the parents could buy in to say that this um, software or hardware was also important for their children more than, for example, um, selling selling it. Um, So what that particular team did was develop uh, some apps for the parents to say, here's how it would be useful so that parents could really buy in and say, okay, this is something that's going to change all of our lives. And certainly the highest number of illiterate people in the world are women. Um, Women tend to be the uh, caretakers and and take care of young children. So it is our expectation that there will probably be people around. There will certainly kids tend to have adults somewhere nearby. Um, So we, um, anybody can use it. As I mentioned, we just sort of we want people to use the software. You know, it's, it's a tricky balance between it being a competition, but also we want to see how it's used just in general because part of this is to say, how will this actually work when people um, are, are using it and it's not a competition? So um, one thing that we do get questions uh, about quite a bit is that we are not having Internet as part of these tablets. Um, and p- there's a number of reasons that we made that decision, but the biggest one was because a lot of places still don't have Internet. We think that Internet is everywhere um, often, um, and certainly there are a lot of places that there are, but particularly the places where kids don't have access to schools, um, we don't want something that is in- Internet dependent. We want people to be able to um, use this software regardless if they have Internet or not. There will be a sort of intranet, and there will be a way for teams to be able to get the information back at various points of the competition to see how the kids are learning. They'll have a couple of opportunities to um, adjust their software um, based on the learning of kids. Um, We're hoping that also part of what people will do is try to accommodate for um, learning differences. Um, That's something that people will be able to to design for. Um, So, yeah, it's certainly, it's, it's it's a big question. There is nothing new under the sun. And if that's true, if we start with that premise, there's a great deal already out there and this fragmentation, of, you know, bringing together, seems to me that would be a great benefit of uh, um, this kind. Because there's so much, and if they connect up, they create something that could address 
global illiteracy. Yes. Well, thank you. And that's, what, and that's what we hope when I was mentioning the sort of crowdsourcing of innovation. It's been amazing to me. I wasn't, you know, from this world. As I mentioned, I was a professor before. And so now I'm finding myself at these, you know, gamer conferences and software conferences and things. And learning that there are people who are excited to do this work or who had no idea what was going on. Um, but there are all these sort of pockets and to try to bring it together and say, what is everybody doing? What are the lessons learned? Um, you know, we're, gonna, we're having a repository where people can just put their code, all sorts of things, um, to really learn from each other throughout this process. I also want to mention that one thing um, that we like to do at XPRIZE is have... Uh, smaller competitions within the big competition. So we're planning on doing things with um, high school students, um, probably with coding um, around human rights issues, um, partnering with other nonprofit organizations. Um, so we want to be able to have something, even if people aren't actually competing, that they're engaging in these issues and also learning some of these important skills that are coming out of this sort of competition. You mentioned there's going to be a pre-assessment and then kind of a post-assessment yes. in terms of literacy and numeracy. Can you talk a little bit about what it is you're assessing for? Um, yes, yeah, so we are using, as I mentioned, um, EGRA and EGMA. So these are testing, um, and we have it actually, they, they're all, they're an international standard of assessment, um, and it's all on their website. I'm trying to think how much of it is in my brain, but there are things that are like, um, you know, how many words they would have, building a sentence, um, uh, being able to recognize numbers, do a word problem, that sort of thing. So it's a standard assessment, um, and we made sure that the various countries that we are um, considering as our potential host countries have already done this sort of testing. So it's the testing that... Um, international development work uses that governments around the world use um, that is in their local language so that it's something, obviously, we're not going to come in and try to test people in English um, in a non-English speaking community. Uh, so, yeah, so there's all sorts of standards, and that will be in our um, in our rules and regulations exactly what they're going to be tested on so, so designers will know beforehand and competitors. Feel free to come by and see me. Uh, you can reach us again, learning.xprize.org, or I'm at emily.church at xprize.org. Um, and thank you again for allowing me to speak here. It really has been amazing to watch the design work you all do um, in, in doing this, this innovation. So thank you so much. <laughs>